All right, how's everyone doing? Are you ready for another great day of UbuCon? Yeah. Welcome to the Ubuntu Leadership Panel. This is going to be a great hour where you're going to get some questions in and we're going to, we're going to grill these wonderful people on what's going on in Ubuntu, right? So before we get started, I'm going to introduce everybody. We've got a nice mixture of members of Canonical as well as leaders in the Ubuntu community. So first of all, I'd like to invite up to the yeah. stage I'm sorry to interrupt, but I have a small piece of housekeeping. As oh, I housekeeping. Before, before we do the big thing and, and have the good time here with this, um, you may have noticed that Dell is raffling off a beautiful XPS today. So you have your raffle tickets, do you not? The XPS will be raffled off here at the end of the session, is that correct? I believe so, yeah. Okay. Also, Nathan Haynes, we talked about his book uh, earlier. It's a new book. It's a great book on migrating to Ubuntu from other platforms. Uh, that he has several copies he's going to be um, raffling off, and those will be raffled off in the session following when we schedule the on-session conferences. So with that, you know Jonah Bacon, and we'll let him introduce the panel. Thank all you. right, let's do this. So first of all, I'd like to welcome to the stage Jose Ray, who is a leader in the Ubuntu community. Yeah, give him a big round of applause. Sit over there. Next up, you all know him, Nathan Haynes, another great leader in the Ubuntu community. We've also got Elizabeth K. Joseph, who has been around Ubuntu for a long time, a systems and automation engineer at HP Enterprise. <laughs> Some are familiar with this man, the founder and leader of Canonical, Mark Shuttleworth. <laughs> All right. Next up, Ollie Rees, an Ubuntu engineering leader at Canonical. David Panella, the Ubuntu community team leader at Canonical. <laughs> Who are missing? Who are missing? Have we got everyone? Someone from the community council, I think, Daniel Holbach. Oh, we don't want him. Do we want him? <laughs> Daniel Holbach from the community <laughs> council. <laughs> All right, we have a full compliment, right? I'm not missing any. This is a big panel. Are we yes. missing anyone? Okay. All right, so this is going to be, we've got an hour. Panels at conferences usually suck um, because you don't get a lot of discussion and people go on for a while. So my goal here, I've taken this goal as a moderator very seriously, and my goal here is to make sure that we've got plenty of discussion here and that we have people answering efficiently. So panelists, I'm going to cut you off if you ramble on too long, so please keep it swift. I've also been around UbuCon talking to various Ubuntu community members and I've been asking what you want to hear from the panel, like what's on your mind, what's interesting to you. So we're going to do that. We're going to also have some, some of your questions partway through, and then at the end, we're going to have a quick fire round where we can just blast through some quick <coughs> questions. Okay? Yeah. Yeah? All right. So why don't we start here? We talk about Ubuntu, and we've got this incredible convergent vision. Uh, we've got this incredible cloud vision, orchestration vision. But what does success look like? Why don't we start with Mark? What, to you, does success in both the convergence side and the, the cloud side look to you? So those are two areas where I think um, there are waves of innovation still to be done. And what I care about is that we make a community that brings, that is open to people who have vision and uh, time and attention and skills. Um, and who want to essentially make the foundation layers for that, for that innovation, right? Sometimes that's end points. People actually want to do the thing that, you know, uh, they want everyone to use directly. Sometimes it's enablement. It's essentially making a platform that takes care of everything else so that the innovation can happen. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah? it does. Ollie, you, you manage a big chunk of engineering. Like, as, from an engineering perspective, what do you think of in terms of success? Um, success for convergences, I think, if the large user base of, of Ubuntu is going to use um, a system that's powered by Mir and running Unity 8 on top of it and can use all those features that we're predominantly right now um, rolling out through the phone. All right. And for our members of the community teams, mm -hmm. what do you all think, I mean, as members of who don't have to be paid to work on Ubuntu, who do this voluntarily, 
What do you think of success? I can probably speak for all of us that uh, success on the uh, convergence side will be when I don't have to bring my laptop to scale. I can just bring my phone. <laughs> and uh, for me, on the cloud side is uh, when everything is in place so that if I'm making a snap, uh, I can work on it uh, in the audience during a boring spit on my phone and then test on my laptop and deploy it to the cloud all on the same device. That, that's that's uh, convergence uh, success for me and cloud success for me. Anyone else want to weigh in? David? I think um, as well in terms of, uh, of community success is, uh, is when we get the thriving community of uh, app developers, of contributors who are passionate about the work that they're doing, that they are as excited as we all are who work every day on Ubuntu uh, about the work that, um, that we're doing and that they want to be part of it um, and that they want to uh, really feel that they're making the, the project uh, successful. Yeah, there's one other thing that I want to weigh in on, on the convergence front is that I, I think a lot of people haven't yet understood is that in the process of making the new personal computing platform, what we're, one of the things we're really cleaning up is the, is the security story, right? The way applications are delivered, the way the, the way the relationship is between you, your data, and the application vendor effectively is profoundly changing in the, in the process. So I can't wait to, to move my laptop to the new framing of, the new essentially snappy framing of a personal computer, um, simply because it'll give me a much more trustworthy platform, right? I'll have software in a box, every piece of software in its <coughs> box, and that will be guaranteed by the system in the way that, in, in, in the way that today's um, Ubuntu desktop just can't do, right? Uh, today's Ubuntu desktop is from the same sort of era as Windows or, or every other sort of traditional operating system. All the software sees everything, right? And uh, that doesn't work in a world where we are very aggressively moving software on and off of our devices from all sorts of different places where we have no real trust relationship with those ISVs, right? We only really trust the ISV for the data we're feeding that application, but we actually give that ISV access to all the data on our laptops. So um, a lot of people might think, you know, do I really want a phone running Ubuntu? I've got a perfectly good phone as it is. That's not the issue. The issue is can we make a much better, much safer, much more productive desktop environment? Yes, we can. And the work that we've done uh, in Unity 8 and in the conversion story is all of the foundations lining up for that. So Daniel, you've been, you've been with Ubuntu now for pretty much since the beginning. And I think many of us would agree that the community over the course of those 10 years has changed, it's adjusted. Some critics would say that the community is smaller these days in some areas and larger in other areas. How, have you, how do you feel in your community position that the community has adjusted and shaped and changed over time? Um, it, it has ch changed indeed, um, especially in the development area. It always was quite exclusive because um, we needed to, to trust you, um, there were a lot of rules to be followed, and I think this is getting much and much easier nowadays. Um, just yesterday, I was talking to somebody, and we snapped up their project in two minutes, which is which is great. And that's going to be available over all form factors. Like the the store is is making it much, 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 much easier to get your get your software included. So um, I think we're we're taking taking the right steps. Definitely. And Liz, you've also played a, a key leadership role in the Ubuntu community. How do you feel like things have changed or evolved in your eyes? Um, I mean, it's definitely been a, a huge change, as, as Daniel said. Um, different, different roles. Um, first of all, in development, has changed a lot, as he said. Um, but also, uh, things like uh, translations, um, those used to be done um, very, pretty much on the operating system itself. But now if you look at the translations mailing list, there are always calls going out for, you know, translate this thing on the phone or translate this other app over here. Um, so that it's a much more diverse team, and I think it's drawing in different types of people than the ones who were just translating applications in the operating system directly. Um, there, there are also are parts that are kind of stalling. Um, so we have initiatives to do certain things, and then maybe documentation is, is languishing a bit. Um, so there's a bit of work to be done as well um, to sort of revive some of the projects that went dormant for some reason. Um, and we have sort of a duty, I think, to make sure that they're getting attention and um, getting the volunteers they need. Because we've simplified development a lot, but there are other ways we can simplify documentation and other places in the project, I think. Great. And Jose, you, you've helped newcomers come to Ubuntu quite a lot over the years. 
How would you say the newcomer experiences? Because back in the early days of Ubuntu, arguably it was a lot more complicated to get involved, but these days we've got a lot of initiatives in place. How would you describe that? Yeah, so um, I believe one or two years ago we launched community.ubuntu.com, which is a place where you can find all the information you need to start contributing to Ubuntu. And this is something uh, that's really helped us get new people into the community, uh, especially because you can find everything you need to get involved with the team uh, right ahead in just one page. And the fact that you can just join an IRC channel or, or subscribe to a mailing list and, and send yourself an email, um, it's, it's pretty encouraging for others to contribute because uh, it's, it's completely open, so anyone can just go ahead and, and submit a patch. Uh, if they find something they, they need to fix, they just go ahead and uh, submit a patch for that specific uh, thing they want to fix. Or um, in, in now, we've got, uh, we've got Google Code in. Uh, we are just finishing Google Code in. It's, finishes, it's finishing next week. Uh, and we've got a lot of, of high school students that uh, are getting involved with uh, the Ubuntu community um, by participating with short tasks. And they are finding out that it's quite easy to uh, contribute uh, with translate, uh, translations, not actually translations, but, but documentation, uh, simply uh, fixing simple things uh, in, in the code and, and all these things. And I think that's uh, also a great new door to contributors. It's, being, uh, it's becoming way easier to contribute to Ubuntu in these, in these days. Thank you. No yeah, oh, go ahead. Um, I also mentioned if you, if you go to community.ubuntu.com and find it, if you find any problems with it, find it lacking in any, any way, it's all of us who maintain that site. We're just humans who um, already know how to do all of this stuff. So we'd really appreciate new eyes looking at that website and giving us feedback as to what we can improve and what we, we need to be adding to that site. Great. Now, I want to throw this up into the whole panel. Uh, if for one reason to awkward, have an awkward moment where someone wants to potentially answer first. What would you all say has been the biggest accomplishment in the last 12 months and the biggest mistake? And it has to be both. You can't just pick the accomplishment, people. <laughs> in the interest of honesty, transparency, frankness, we're not going to judge you all. I'll start. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So I'll start with a good one. Um, the rise of the UbuCons in, in our community has, I think, been the most exciting thing for me. Um, there's been an UbuCon, there's, there was one here last year, there's this UbuCon Summit now. Uh, there was an UbuCon, I think, in Germany, right? Um, there was one in Florida, there was one that I went to in uh, Lima with Jose. Um, these are, until this one, they were completely community-run events, really, um, and they've been a huge, huge change in our community, that's been really good. Um, it's been really fun being able to visit different ones um, and see fellow community members. Um, this past year I was on the community council and we dealt with some problems slowly, I think. We had some issues in the Kubuntu community and it, it took us a long time to turn around answers to the community. Um, it was because it was a hard problem that we were dealing with with them, um, but we should have been quicker. Um, things sort of festered and that was, that was a bad time. Um, I don't know how we can do it better, but we have a, you know, fresh blood on the community council and I'm hoping <laughs> um, that things will change. I want to weigh, on, weigh in on, on what, what Liz talked about there. So I think there's three kinds of leadership, right? This is a leadership, leadership panel. It is indeed. And I, and I love the, the idea that in Ubuntu we're giving people the opportunity to find leadership within themselves, you know, f to learn how to lead and to, to, to try to lead. It's, it's challenging. Anyway, just so, uh, I think there's three kinds of leadership. There's, there's stepping into um, sort of fairly well-defined territory and creating energy. So for example, uh, translations. Most of the mechanisms for translations are there and, and, and often what makes a huge difference is somebody essentially coming in and bringing energy and saying, look, here's an area where we can motivate a bunch of people, crack on. The, 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 the path is well-trodden. It just requires motiva motivation and leadership to get people there and it's amazing. You can actually see sort of waves as people come in and, 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 and bring passion to an area like that. That's one kind of leadership, it's really important. And it's a fairly easy thing for people to step into because it's always non-controversial, right? Um, there's another kind of leadership which is where you want to do something new. And so we saw a great example of this was the Ubuntu Mate uh, initiative. Great leadership, right? Uh, small group, um, strong leadership, passionate about a sort of clearly articulated idea, able to, to muster um, participation and contribution, and everybody else essentially rallies around that to enable it, right? To help square away all the points of interlock <coughs> between what those guys want from Ubuntu and what everybody else needs from Ubuntu, right? And then there's the third kind of leadership, which is, you know, it requires much more kind of wisdom, 
which is um, conflict resolution and, and real governance leadership, right? Um, in open source, there's this misunderstanding about the relationship between governance and leadership. And so we see projects, huge projects, which are massively overwhelmingly governed, but have no leadership whatsoever, right? And uh, without naming names, they become dysfunctional, right? Because you have all this energy going in, but no real ability to kind of st d uh, make decisions. Um, what Liz is talking about was a case where we had a, a real need f at a very senior level in the project that couldn't really come from Canonical um, for, for the ability to make real decisions about human aspects, about what's right and what's wrong, and, 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 and the ability to essentially um, exercise judgment. And that was incredibly difficult. It is an incredibly difficult thing to do, but we have to do it. So um, I was very, very proud that although it took time, the community council that we had at the time eventually said, you know what, we're going to act and we're going to take steps that may be seen to be unpopular, but essentially they're about defending a way of working together inside this project. We're not going to let a strong, first forceful personality kind of derail things just because they're strong and forceful, right? And that required real courage, it required real strength. Um, actually, Liz, I think the challenge when you have something like the community council, which is elected and which naturally has turnover, is that you have to keep reminding yourself to find that strength every time. You know, the new guys who come in haven't seen what you've seen, which is that actually a reluctance to act under circumstances like that isn't helpful, right? right? It is decisiveness and, and the willingness to essentially make unpopular decisions that's called for. And we have to keep reminding ourselves that that's needed. Someone like Linus in Linux obviously doesn't have to be reminded about that. He's clearly got the hang of it. And, uh, and I think that's a great thing, right? That's the thing that, that, that larger, more distributed projects often struggle with. Uh, and I hope that our new CC you know, will we'll build on what we've done in the past. All right. I would, I would pick up again the, the subject of Ubukons as, um, as something that um, I think everyone who's here on the table and uh, in the audience as well are very, very passionate about. But I'm going to pick up one particular example, and it was the organization of this particular Ubukon. Um, so we got together, a um, few of us here on this table as well, at uh, past uh, CLS, the Community Leadership Summit, uh, a few months ago. And uh, we had this, this discussion about, um, well, we had several discussions about leadership, but in particular, we had some discussions on the fact that uh, we as a community, the Ubuntu community, hadn't really been getting together uh, in big events for, for quite a while, which in some cases, um, it didn't help with some frictions that there were in, in some sensitive dis discussions. Um, I'm particularly proud uh, for having been part of those discussions and for having worked with, uh, with all of these guys. But one thing that, uh, that I have really enjoyed with uh, working in particular with, with uh, Nathan, Liz, uh, Richard Gaskin this month in the organization of the, of the Wukong Summit was the fact that um, we, Canonical as a company, uh, participated in this and we worked together with volunteers to organize this event. The Wukong at scale um, has been an event that's been running for seven, eight years now. And um, we wanted to make sure, as in Canonical, the community team, that it was not something that we just barge in um, and, uh, and try to make it our event. This was about creating synergies, about working together to, to make it much bigger. And I think every one of us has learned quite a lot about, uh, about this. This is something that, uh, that we'll apply to, um, to build on, uh, on subsequent uh, Ubucons around the world. Um, and also, I think this has highlighted as well um, the leadership in particular from Nathan and, uh, and Richard in being the main organizers of, uh, of the conference. Um, I was having this conversation with, uh, with Nathan a few days ago um, where he was saying, yeah, I, we've been organizing Wukong for a while, but we could have never imagined that, that it would evolve to that, to this event where some people, while I'm not, this, I'm not at the same scale, I've been told many times this week that has this UDS feel from the past uh, Ubuntu developer summits. Of course, I'll say it's not at the, at the same scale, but I think um, it's a really good step in the, in the right direction in creating these stronger bonds within the, the Ubuntu community, which also make, make us stronger as, uh, as a community. Fantastic. So in the spirit of the Republican debate, you're all avoiding answering my question. Oh, sorry. Um, was... Nathan, best thing in the last 12 months, worst thing in the last 12 months? <laughs> well, uh, first I want to say, um, in the spirit of those debates, um, I'd like to uh, uh, dither for a second and say that we, Richard and I did have plans to, for giant Ebicons, maybe we said, well, we'll gradually get there over a few years, um, but um, thanks to the canonical community team, we were able to do this 
in a couple months, a few months, and, and uh, we're really grateful. They were super helpful, and um, we, we worked really well together. They, they, they were a great help. Um, I think that the, I'd say that the rise of these, I hate to say that, yes, the UBICON summits are probably the best uh, thing to come uh, up in the community in the last 12 months, but I really think we are seeing these, this resurgence of community-led events. Uh, and as a member of the uh, LOCO uh, Council, the local community council that's important to me, I think, um, I haven't been on the council for 12 months, but I, I think we are seeing a sort of, um, in the early days of the community, Ubuntu was this big new project and we had this new direction and there was a lot of energy and fire. It was a really exciting goal. And I think we sort of met the Ubuntu goals in, in large part and, and now we're ramping up for convergence and for the next step. But I think the energy sort of waned because um, everything just works. And so um, some of the loco teams are, are not as active globally as I'd like. And, and we're seeing people just, they've been doing this for uh, Ubuntu's uh, 11 and a half years old now and, and, and people are getting tired. So we need to uh, get more energy into some of the teams. And so um, I, um, I definitely would like to see more, more energy in the local teams around the world. Uh, and in the U.S., and so I will see what I can do to help encourage others. Um, I think that anyone who wants to be involved in the community can just step up and do it. Uh, find the others, find the team, let them know what you're up to. You don't need permission. But I think that sense of agency uh, sometimes is, is not well communicated. So I think that's sort of a failure uh, on my part as part of the uh, LOCO Council, and uh, I'm going to see what I can do about it this year. Fantastic. Now, <clears throat> it would be remiss if I didn't ask some difficult questions. And then we're going to move on to audience questions, I think. So in recent months, there's been the elephant in the room has been the, the this is a question to my friends in Canonical, the, the elephant in the room has been the IP policy. There's been some people who've been very critical of the policy. There are some people who are very supportive of the policy. And I think most people don't actually care very much. But my question to Canonical is, what is causing some ambiguity and some discomfort in the community? What are your thoughts on how we can best address that to remove that ambiguity and discomfort? There's no ambiguity whatsoever. None <laughs> whatsoever, right? This is, this is the classic teach the controversy, you know, bullshit, FUD spreading mechanism that we, we see in, in the open source political field, just like we see it in other political fields. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll state the exact position, and then I'll also say like why um, it gets described as ambiguous. So the exact position is that if you want to distribute a modified Ubuntu image, in other words, an image that has um, that is not one of the ones that you can download from Canonical.com, then you need to have permission to do that, which we do on a routine basis. We've done it hundreds, perhaps thousands of times for community projects, for companies, for clouds, and so on. And it comes down to the simple fact that we can't have it both ways. We can't say you can do whatever you like, but then we reserve the right to come tell you not to do it. Right? So for example, the example I gave in a session yesterday, if we found an image out there that had a keylogger, and we, we found this, for example, on, on Amazon, on clouds, that there'd be an image which advertises itself as very useful, right? And it is very useful. It's got a whole bunch of pre-installed software on it, and you just have to enter some passwords. And it turns out that that's a phishing scheme scam, right? Because the passwords that you use there are almost certainly going to be passwords that you're using elsewhere. So um, in order to preserve the right to say, no, that is not acceptable, we have to say that, and this is absolutely standard, every open source project faces this, we have to say that if you want to redistribute a modified image, you've got to ask for permission. So there is no ambigu ambiguity. That is the rule. It has always been the rule. It is applied absolutely fairly and openly. There's no difficulty in this whatsoever. The guy who makes the biggest noise about this asked for permission to do that, and he got that permission within like 12 hours, and then spent months and months and months saying that that was completely unacceptable, right? That's just teach the controversy. And so don't feed it. Please, Jono, don't <laughs> feed it, right? I'm not feeding it. I'm when just asking say, the questions that the yeah, audience... No, no, like, no, but what? don't... <clears throat> It. This is like saying that climate change is controversial among scientists. It's not, right? Every serious scientist says that that's the fact, right? Eben Moglen says that what we do is right, right? So the only people who want 
to you to think that there's controversy here, or that's all they want you to think is that this is controversial, right? So, um, uh, and, and that's why this, you know, beca becomes a thing, because there are folks who would, you know, who, who um, have their own projects that they would like to give airtime to, and they see Ubuntu as a, com as a competition to that. The guy in question works for a direct competitor, right? So just generating headlines that say, oh, this is controversial, to suppress people's natural sort of happiness with Ubuntu, I, I just don't want to feed that anymore. I think it's nonsense. Any other comments from the panel? Yes, I'll, I'll say something. If, well, I will say I think it's unfair to characterize him as a competitor because I, I believe the person in question is... is Only I, working for a competitor. <laughs> maybe, but I, I, I think that's a little unfair. Um, right. But um, that aside, I think um, generally from the community perspective, it's not clear how to ask for that permission. Um, honestly, I don't know how. Um, so I think maybe if that was made more clear, um, it would help dispel some of this. I don't yeah. know, maybe. <laughs> in the controversial IP policy in question, it says, please email this email address. Okay. And if you do that, you get an answer, right? So um, the, the other, the, the, the reason um, ambiguity came into the, the, <coughs> the, the frame is that in many cases, there are good reasons why you don't provide, you don't say this is exactly when you, what you can do, right? Because you then essentially have to anticipate all of the things that people might do. And a good example of this is the FSF themselves who will not answer the simple question, when does the GPL apply, right? And there's a very good reason why they won't do that. They would much rather essentially leave it up to you to figure out whether what you have done means that the GPL applies to the work that you're creating. That's standard policy um, at the FSF, effectively. Um, and so, for, for exactly the same reason, we don't, we, 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 we um, won't answer the question, when will we not grant a license, right? Because then we would have had to anticipate all of the cases where that somebody might do something that we would regret having blanket granted that, right? We do do some of those things. For example, we say when work goes through the archive, you can do a remix. And so that has two effects. It encourages people to collaborate at, at the core, right, to actually do what Mate does and what others do, come join the Ubuntu community and work in the archive. It also then allows us to have visibility on all the code that's being changed because those remixes are built out of the archive. We see all the source code, we see the build process, we see the image build process. We can then make that, we can very easily say that's a remix, go for it, right? So there, we have mechanisms which are reasonable mechanisms to give people the ability to do what they want to do. It's only, I think, uh, a toxic um, angle to sort of say that the other mechanisms that we have somehow aren't suitable. Okay. Any other comments? All right. Why don't we move on to some audience questions? So does anyone have any questions about any topic? You can cover whatever you want. There. If you yell your question out, and I'll uh, repeat it for the cameras. <clears throat> Okay, the question is, do you have any plans to sell Canonical? No. You, you can make that check out the cash and I'll handle it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next question. Over here. You can just shout it out. Could you say that a little louder, please? Is there like a tutorial, like if you wanted to host a community event and you're like a new local team, oh. is there a good place to look for documentation or stuff on that? So the question is, is there a good place to find documentation or guidance on how to host a local event? Yeah, I think we have on uh, local.ubuntu.com, we link to a lot of uh, local documentation on best practices, how to set up events. Um, and there's also links to, to the mailing list so you can get in touch with people from other local teams. That's usually the, the easiest way to go about it. You just ask people who have experience there already. Questions? Over here. I'm 
just wondering, uh, as now our team is uh, slightly crippled, um, where are resources for us to go when, when you know, we're looking at, at new ways to work through our workflow? This is for the Kubuntu project. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what are tools and methodologies and guidance for, for Kubuntu to produce great Kubuntu releases and workflow? <laughs> Sorry. Um, I think um, one thing that, uh, that that's really really good from the from the Kubuntu team is that it's a team that traditionally has been really really collaborative with uh, with, um, with the Ubuntu team with uh, with upstream, and this is something that um, perhaps in the last few months with uh, with all discussions that have been happening um, has set them uh, a bit apart. I mean, what I would recommend is to continue talking to those leaders in the, uh, in the Ubuntu community that can, uh, can give advice on how to, to best, uh, how to best work together, essentially. I mean, in terms of getting new contributors, there's, there's practices that, that apply throughout, uh, regardless of, uh, of the project. I mean, one of the, 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 I think one of the pieces of advice that I would, that I would give is the, to make sure that, uh, that the team communicates well what they're doing. There's something that really, really encourages uh, new contributors um, and also um, users to see uh, what progress uh, has been happening and getting them excited about the, about the project. Um, having conversations with, uh, with the different um, councils in Ubuntu as well to ask for, uh, to ask for advice as well is something that, um, that, that all, always works. Um, but in essence, in summary, perhaps, uh, going to those leaders in the community and, and, and getting advice, I would say. I think, um, also, um, we've sort of floated, I work on Zubuntu, and we've sort of floated the idea of having a cross-flavor mailing list or IRC channel where we can all get together and share best practices. Um, we do it sort of ad hoc right now. Um, we all hang out in the release channel, and we all uh, sit in different areas where we sort of pitch in on things. Um, but there hasn't really been a collective push in the community to get us all together at the same table. And I think now that we have so many flavors, um, like with MADE coming in and, and Ubuntu GNOME and other things, it may be time that our ad hoc approach maybe isn't working quite as well anymore and we all need to get together somewhere. Um, so we should, we should chat later, um, see if we can come up with some ideas. <laughs> so a follow-up question that <coughs> a few people um, in the community were interested in was with all the talk about Snappy and the opportunities that Snappy brings to distributions, what do we think that Snappy could bring to distributions such as Kubuntu or Zubuntu to make it easier to build the derivative in that way? Um, so I'll speak to that. Uh, we, in, in the design of Snappy, we've consciously um, uh, um, factored that in so that it'd be possible to make a Snappy application that, for example, is a Kubuntu Snappy application. Uh, snaps can essentially s um, say that they, they're going to depend on the system uh, to provide specific, um, we call them skills, uh, kind of capabilities. And so you could have a snap that says, I, I need uh, Kubuntu, right, or I need KDE effectively. And then that would expect that there's a set of system services that are being provided, uh, which that snap will depend on. So it's a much more lightweight way of specifying dependencies than saying I depend on this package to be installed. It's just saying I don't know how that, I don't care how that service is provided. I just need that to be there. So we've done that deliberately so that uh, Snappy as a mechanism is useful for, um, for the other distros. And I think that's going to be super useful because I'm guessing that the vast majority of work that goes into producing something like Kubuntu in, is, in, involves packaging in DEBs, um, you know, many applications. Now, the core libraries, you probably want to keep packaging as DEBs because they're useful for other people. But the end nodes, the applications, probably a hell of a lot easier to snap. Uh, Daniel's example there was a, a guy here at the conference had a thing that he'd written, took two minutes to make a snap of it. We've just essentially tried to get rid of all the bureaucracy and policy. The exchange for that, of course, is that the snap lives within its own confined world, right? But that's fine for, for an app. So, um, so if that trade works for you, then I think you'll be able to energize people to kind of do that work. And there's also a nice feature of the, of the store that you can have multiple uh, release channels. So you could theoretically have something which um, does automatic builds, uploads them to the store, and people who are subscribed to the, to the um, Edge channel, they, they get them instantly. So uh, let, me, let me riff a little on what Daniel's Beautiful. saying there. So, so two, two key ideas. The first is that... Um, um, it's going to be a lot easier with Snappy to bring new versions of applications to old versions of the distro. 
-hmm. in, in a world where everything is a dev, we have this tremendous interlock problem where a new version of an app that depends on a new version of a library we can't bring in because that would mean an upgrade of the old version of the library and we don't know who's depending on that and blah. Right? So in the snappy world, by drawing that hard line, we lose one nice thing, which is you know, a guarantee of a fix to a library fixes everything that depends on the library. But we gain the ability very easily to bring a new version of LibreOffice, bring a new version of Firefox, bring a new version of the browser, or the big KDE applications, right? which are big complex applications. So they'll become fatter as, as binaries, but they'll also become more agile. So my, my expectation, and it's just a guess, is that what you'll see is that a community like yours might well shift towards saying, look, we're just going to provide snaps of the newer KDE apps on the older LTS releases. So that way there's a, there's a core that is the LTS that gets maintained and then the apps are moving faster, which is nice for developers, nice for users as well. Right, right. And so the, then the other half um, of that, what Daniel is referring to, is that if I've installed a name like LibreOffice, right, a snap of that name, Actually, within that name, instead of having different PPA versions, I can actually have channels of that version. So you can be pushing out for the same release, like 1604, you can be pushing out the stable version of a KDE app and the alpha version of the next version of that KDE app in the same channel so that people can test it out and switch between those very, very easily without upgrading the whole, the whole desktop. So we've really thought a lot about trying to decouple parts of the community to enable them to go faster. It'll be different, it'll be new, some people will be upset, it'll be controversial, there'll be headlines, <laughs> but I think it'll be better. Right? Yeah. Very cool. Ryan, did you have a question? Yeah. Right, so remember the phone is not yet on Snappy, so the, the Snappy is kind of... Uh, Sorry, Mark, did everyone hear the question? No. Sorry, just so everyone heard, the question was around, um, around a background service in, in Ubuntu phone and, and how that could work. Sorry, go ahead. So the, the <coughs> original iteration of this work was a thing called Click, and Click, they were starting to get to the point where we were, you know, we were still using the Deb framework, but we wanted to start to box these applications in, so the, the emphasis was really on the confinement story. That work has evolved and evolved again, so we're now coming up to about, you can call it Snappy 3.0 is what we'll go into 16.04. And that has explicit support for services. So in a Snap, you can have multiple apps. So for example, if you have a, 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 um, a, a GUI application and a background service, those are two separate apps in the Snap. And one of them can be described as a service so that it will be started on boot, for example. You can essentially describe <coughs> the, the characteristics of that, and we will map that either to Upstart or System D or whatever is essentially starting and stopping services on the system. So that's explicitly supported in Snappy. And bear in mind on the phone, we also have an issue about battery life in a way that we don't really have on servers or connected devices. So on the phone, the decision was taken to essentially not have stuff running in the background because we couldn't predict the impact that would have on performance or battery life. With the phone moving to Snappy, we'll have to figure out how to square that circle. But we have, we've also gained a lot of primitives, for example, in LexD, which we'll use in Snappy. We've gained the ability to make a little container, for example, and bound the memory and GPU, CPU time allocated to it. So that's the way we might have a service that can be put in the background and know that it's, gonna, it's going to be well behaved effectively. Down here. This is a little bit more of a uh, technical question than a community question, but most of my time spent on Ubuntu Server. Is there going to be a command line app like application for installing Snappy packages? Does that already exist? And when dealing with applications that are Dockerized, can I still deploy those with Snappy? So the question is is there going to be a command line app for Snap for installing Snaps? And, and the, is there a Is there a way to deploy Dockerized applications via Snappy? Um, so yes and yes. There will be a <coughs> Snappy command on your normal Ubuntu Debian-based server or desktop. You'll just say Snappy install X, and X is a name like what I was describing earlier. Now, of course, if X 
requires capabilities or skills from the platform that, that you don't have. So you won't be able to install a phone application on a Wi-Fi base station, right? But, um, but assuming that there's a fit there, then you'll get that, you'll get that thing. Um, and then second, your second question is about Docker. Yes, in fact, Docker um, is available on Snappy systems. And so you can, you can, you can <coughs> say, I've got a Snap. Uh, I need Docker on the system. And, uh, and then you can spin up the Docker containers. So you could do, for example, Kubernetes or something like that as a Snap if you wanted to. Yeah. All right, so we're going to move on to a quick, quick fire section here. I've got a few questions here. I'm going to ask each of the panelists to provide a really quick single sentence response. And we'll see how many of these we can get through. All right, we'll start, at, uh, we'll start with Jose at the end. First question is, name someone who inspires you in the work that you do. Liz. Liz has been mentoring me since I got into the community. Great. Nathan. Um, uh, well, Jono, actually, because uh, he's always so enthusiastic. Uh, I knew early on uh, at my first scale, scale 6x, that when we were at the booths, afraid we'd never done it before. He was like, this is great. Good job. Keep up the good work. And uh, I've been doing that for eight years now. Thank you. Liz. All right. Um, I'll say it's uh, Richard Gaskin. He's not on the stage. You're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Mark. Uh, there was a guy called Mohandas K. Gandhi, and I thought he was pretty awesome. <laughs> Ollie. Um, it's the teams and people I work with that inspire me to come to work every day. David. All right. I'll pick someone from the Ubuntu community, but someone who's uh, relative or not, well, not one of the old suspects from the Ubuntu community. That's one of the core app developers, Nicholas Ramanantan, who's Oh. so much positive energy, so much uh, passion. It's been incredible working with him. Good choice. Daniel. Andrew. Andrew Stavucicio. Uh, we've worked together on the, on the Motu team, on, on lots of other teams, and he was always around, always did crazy amounts of work over the weekend. It was brilliant. Great. Now we're going to start at this end, so poor Jose doesn't have to think in his feet within seconds. <laughs> Second question, what is the most successful and enjoyable thing that you've experienced in this UbuCon so far? Meeting the people is very easy. It was just brilliant to, to look into, into the faces of, of everyone I met when we were in, in the bar and were chatting. It was just like meeting family again. David. For me, it was, uh, it was good to see the um, people talking positively about, uh, about, uh, about Ubukon and seeing the attendant on the, on the first sessions, uh, how people were excited about this, and in particular, seeing Nathan's session being, re being really, really well attended, and people yeah, excited about what we're doing. Ollie. Uh, the positive vibe we see here, it's uh, really good conversations yesterday at the party and, and the little time we spent in sessions, and just see the feedback and the interaction live face-to-face -face was really, really good. Mark. Uh, for me, I, I love seeing new leaders, right? And uh, there are quite a few folks here who I think um, I'd never met before, never seen in action. They're amazing people. They are bringing um, integrity and passion and professionalism to, uh, to, to the things they care about in Ubuntu. Um, and and uh, in many cases, those are things that I, don't, I didn't know about. So it's great for me to see the project getting stronger because there are people bringing things to it that I couldn't even imagine. Bless. Um, so I'll, I'll sort of similar to what Daniel said, um, getting to see people. I'm not really a very social person generally, but um, I've really enjoyed the social events that we've had, um, getting to see people, people I haven't seen in years, and getting to meet new people in the community um, who I hadn't met before. Um, it's really energizing. And as you mentioned during your talk yesterday, um, you know, the, there was a way the community used to be. And when you're talking about all our memories and putting up the pictures, I'm like, aw. <laughs> <laughs> but then we have it again. I, yeah. I feel like these nights we've had together it's have been really never gone away. Nathan. Uh, probably getting up here on stage to give the big kickoff and introduce Mark Shuttleworth because Richard and I had talked very vaguely about what we were going to do and who says yeah. uh, what part and we came up here and ad-libbed and uh, we spent all these months working on, the, on, on this event and getting up here and just kicking it off and then stepping back and watching uh, all the wonderful presenters just work their magic, which led, of course, then to the party last night where all I had to do was um, see how much of the wine I could drink in the time allotted, so challenge accepted. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> Jose. Uh, definitely seeing er all the effort put into the conference come to action. Uh, finally, all the months that uh, Richard and Nathan and part of the community team uh, has been spending in the last couple months uh, trying to get this done to make a great conference, finally uh, coming to life, uh, it's just amazing. And, and the number of people that's here just for the conference is just outstanding. 
All right, next question. <clears throat> if you could have an unlimited set of engineering resources or people at your disposal, what would you be your pet feature you'd love to see in Ubuntu? What's at the top of your, of your wish list? You've been to Edge. <laughs> <laughs> I do a lot of work with nonprofits and schools, so I'd love like a push button LTSP install where you could just install, you know, Ubuntu a bunch of on a bunch of machines, like maybe terminal based or something. But, yeah. uh, Mark, all the things I hoped would make it into 1604, but we'll have to wait for. <laughs> <laughs> Jose, did you wanna? I have no idea. We'll come back to you at the end. All right, <clears throat> Ollie. Um, Hangouts on my phone, on my Ubuntu phone. That's big for me, so I can do all my work on my phone. David. Sudo make sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> the dream is real. <coughs> Daniel. I think for me it would be more of a social thing. I think it would be great if we had resources to help teams with handover, with, with leadership issues, like helping out there. OK. Any thoughts, Jose? For an unlimited number of resources, I would say just fix all the bugs we have in Launchpad. <laughs> no, no, cancel it. He also means they've been to Edge. <coughs> Two votes. All right. Um, final question in the quick fire. Daniel, what is one of your favorite memories as part of the Ubuntu project so far? I know this is a tough one. What I really enjoyed was the, the party we had in, in Prague. Oh. It, was, it was just amazing. We had the <laughs> Ubuntu All Stars play. Uh, James Westby and I were, were playing some music there. We had somebody VJ. It was just, it was just incredible, the, the vibe there. David. For me, it, uh, it must have been the, uh, the first UVS in Barcelona, with, where I had joined Canonical just a couple of months before. And uh, this guy over there essentially told me to prepare the translations track. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Canonical. Exactly. It, was, it was really great to see uh, all of these people who have uh, met, uh, haven't met, hadn't met before, like either from Canonical, well, canonical employees, uh, volunteer community members, and seeing all of these rock stars in action. Oli. Um, so I'm with Ubuntu, with Canonical for like five years now, and the most memorable thing is still like my first two months because it was like just a month drinking off the fire hose and then like meeting everybody that I just saw on IRC um, or talked to an IRC and that was still like a, a memory I go back to quite frequently. Mark, favorite memory? There's a few. So the very first time I hosted what was then called the SSDS, the super secret Debian startup, in my house in London. It was the first time I met all of these amazing DDs. And um, uh, so everybody arrived in London and they all came to the house and, and um, uh, you know, it was about 20 people all sitting around the lounge. And uh, I went out for, um, I don't know, get some snacks or something. Uh, and when I came back into the house, I kind of came through and it was this eerie silence. So I knew that there were 20 people in my lounge, but I couldn't hear anything, right? I thought, what are 20 people doing silently in my house? And it turned out they were all on IRC. Liz. <laughs> 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 And I thought of one, but then I thought of a better one. Um, when we had our developer summit in Copenhagen, I had just spent two weeks in Ghana deploying Ubuntu desktops. So I was in Ghana, which is in uh, uh, Western Africa. And then I flew home to San Francisco for two days to swap out my suitcases. And then I flew to Copenhagen, um, which is closer to Africa than home. <laughs> Um, it was really crazy, and I did a lightning talk um, during the UDS. And then afterwards, for the entire UDS, people were coming up and talking to me about deployments they'd done in Africa, uh, outreach they'd been doing in their organizations, um, recycling programs that they've been working with, because I talked a lot about that in my talk. So it was like an entire week of like all this stuff coming together. I was jet lagged and tired, but I was so excited because we were so many people I didn't even know were working on similar things that I was. Nathan. My favorite memory keeps getting renewed. Um, it was the realization that uh, the Ubuntu community is a, is a uh, the pro entire project is a meritocracy, it's a duocracy. So when I first showed up at scale, Jono was there to encourage us. 
when I wanted to um, complain about um, some branding issues. Uh, Mark uh, had some time for me yesterday. Um, when I wanted to talk in the community Q&A every Tuesday on, uh, on Hangouts on YouTube, uh, I, was, I, I was invited in and jumped in and I, they weren't humoring me. Um, I was welcome there as well. Every single person I've ever met in the Ubuntu community uh, who's a leader and famous is just a great guy, happy to see me, happy to accept the hard work I do and, and, and help out when I need it. And um, I see that as well here uh, in, in, uh, at scale and Ubicon where people want to join in and I can uh, honestly say to them, um, you know, here's where you start, join this channel and you are more than welcome and we want to help you. And uh, I think that from the top, from Mark, all the way down to every last person, that's what makes it Ubuntu special. Jose. Um, I will always remember uh, UDSR and everything that went around it. Um, it was just so fun and, and it was a great experience. All right, so just wrapping up, this has been the Ubuntu leadership panel and I think it would be remiss if we didn't finish off with some final words from arguably the top of the tree of the Ubuntu world. So, Mark, final thoughts. Maybe the bottom of the well, depending on <laughs> the perspective. Um, so I, I thought I'd, I'd talk a little bit about uh, aging gracefully. Um, because we as a project are now headed for 12 years old, right? And we as a bunch of people are substantially older. Um, uh, nature had partially balding in mind for me. As you can see, I've gone with yippee ki motherfucker bald instead, right? <laughs> the truth is you can't avoid time and you can't avoid change, right? And so I enjoy reminiscing, but we're not going to have wild parties in Copenhagen again. You know, it, it would be weird to a certain extent, right? We were founded at a time when there was only one platform and nobody had any choice in the use of that platform. That is just not an issue anymore, right? And so to a certain extent, it's really dangerous, I think, to sort of wish for things to be where they were because the issues have changed. We have changed, right? Here's what I think won't change, that smart, amazing people uh, are going to want to strike out into the unknown and they're, gonna, they're going to want free software as the foundation for doing that. That was true for me in 2004. That's why I started Ubuntu, right? It was, it was the thing that I could do without me having to figure out which of those smart people I should send money to. I could essentially gather a bunch of other passionate people and enable all of those smart people to just do what they do. And they could do that equally whether they came from Ghana, thank you for doing that, or whether they came from, from Southern California, right? So to me, that's never gonna change. And there is always the opportunity for us to essentially be that foundational story for innovation. If we want puppy energy, which is lovely, I love that energy, right? That kind of stop at nothing, get it done, kill, you know, kill the, the bad guy, win the world, get the girl, whatever your analogy is. If we want that energy, then we also have to keep looking at the next wave of what's interesting and difficult and challenging, right? AI in your basement, or um, convergence devices, or anything that someone in this community might see as the next thing. And we really have to work hard to open up the possibility for that. And here's the challenge, right? People will assume things about us which makes it harder for us to do new things, right? So uh, because we are, when, when, we, when we started, we said, hey, all of Linux on one CD, and that was a kind of laughable idea, right? It was a crazy idea in a world where every distro was trying to compete to have 14 CDs, 15 CDs, right? We went with one CD, right? That was a crazy idea, but it worked, right? And now the challenge is we are at much at risk of making our own lives difficult for, for taking that next controversial step, right? If we came up now with the equivalent of, of let's do it all on one CD, half of the criticism of that idea would be internal, would be us unsure about whether we can do that, right? Think how kind of challenging that is. That's middle age, right? You've got things that you already care about, but the world is changing and you have to figure out what crazy ideas are the right ones to bet on for the next time. So, you know, I can't promise that I can always spot the right crazy idea, but I will promise that I'm not afraid of those and we shouldn't be afraid of those and I've got the back of any leader at 
Ubuntu who wants to go out and do things differently. Because I have absolutely no doubt that we have a really profound role to play as kind of the, the, the most accessible, most open, most committed quality, enterprise quality platform for innovation on free software out there. I'm committed that we essentially be that foundational layer for that next stuff. So, sorry, that was a bit of a ramble, but first, those memories are super important. That energy is super important, but let's not get stuck there, right? Let's always be willing to go out and be a little controversial and try new things. They won't always work, right? The edge was a spectacular miss, but only because the time wasn't right, right? The idea, I don't think anybody would say now, was, was, was crazy, right? Wonderful. Here's to the future of Ubuntu. Thank you, panelists, and thank you for bringing your questions. <laughs>